you want a professor to uh, go ta down into the facts, don't confuse professors with the facts. Uh, we are ivory tower, we of course see it from a very, very ivory tower perspective. But what I would like to do is to give you maybe some uh, explanations uh, what is changing and why it is changing. And actually it's a pleasure to be here, thank you very much for the invitation because I just crossed the Danube coming from the west, I'm German, I'm a German citizen, and I recognize that the day I got politicized, the day I got politicized was the 15th of March 1989, crossing the Danube here in Budapest and ending up in a huge demonstration which was yeah, the high time of system change here in Hungary. From that moment on I got politicized, I read a lot of books and one of the famous books of those times was Francis Fukuyama. The end of history, many of you may know it. The Western style democracy, Western style uh, capitalism is the ultima ratio. This is the final destination of where history goes. And for me that was kind of, yeah, enlightening and was clear and yes, why not? So I thought, checking up on Hungary, what will happen actually is that after maybe a painful transformation in the end, the countries of the region will end up reassembling the same model than in Western Europe. So, 2018, after taking a little a break from political sciences and coming back, uh, I see a completely different situation. I just read a book of Kishore Mabuhani, yes, titled has the West lost it? Now, this guy is a classical uh, realist, so I don't really subscribe to his argumentation. But the question, I think, is important. Has the West lost it? And if the West has lost it, where has he lost it on the way? So, uh, I was checking a little bit on uh, party systems, and this is not what I intended to, here we are, on party system, and so to start in the ice ages, the old party systems on the left side here was um, in political sciences uh, predominantly based on um, the research of Lipset Rockan of 1967 and they discovered four cleavages which are structuring party system. One of the cleavage, the dominant cleavage, was workers against employers. So people who are giving work and people who are working. You remember the old uh, the social democratic parties against the more uh, conservative-oriented uh, parties where the entrepreneurs were at home. The second one was religious versus secular. So people attending church services and people being atheists, not attending church services. And then uh, uh, Lipset and Rockan had two cleavages with a territorial dimension and one of them was urban versus rural, so people living in the city, people living in the countryside, in rural areas, and the other one was center against periphery. So it was the big agglomerations, the capital cities, and the rest of the countries. Now, if you take those structure over voter behavior, then you actually receive what you, what you have over there. So this is, you, you are, you are uh, a peasant in the rural area, obviously, attending church services, so most prob uh, probably you are voting conservatives. You are an industrial worker living somewhere in the rural Gebiet in Germany, of course, you are voting socialist. So this was the main axis of party uh, competition, and the three central political forces were in this of voters was the conservatives, 
the liberals and the socialists and the nationalists where they pop, yeah they popped up from time to time but they were without this main axis of party competition now taking this frozen structure because the structure was as as uh, the authors had it quite frozen and did not really change uh, putting those over the, the political situation in Eastern Central Europe, I already had some doubts because, well, we had, in Hungary, for example, we had socialists going into privatization, uh, liberalization, the Washington Consensus was driven by, partly by left-wing left -wing forces and, and in other countries, just uh, uh, some events which you could not really uh, yeah, put into that structure. So I thought, well, okay, this is because uh, uh, everything is fluid. Of course, there are no there are no cl classical employers here in, in in the region. So in the in the long run, if there is a kind of institutional isomorphism, so if the countries here model after the Western model at the end of history, this is the dominant feature. Uh, feature that means that the party systems in East and Central Europe kind of had to have to turn around. It has to fit in the end the frozen stru structure what uh, we have in Western Europe. I was completely wrong. I was completely wrong. It did not. It did not happen. It did not change the way I was predicting it. And I wrote it down in quite some articles. And I have to say, no, I was wrong. So I found a study, and I think this is pretty much explaining what we have uh, today, of 2018, of Marx and Hore, and they are distinguishing between two poles. I call it the latte macchiato drinkers and the beer drinkers, Gal being the latte macchiato drinkers and Tan being the beer drinkers. So Gal stands for dream, alternative, liberal. So those are the elites in the urban centers in Budapest if you walk around. And uh, if I go back to the Hungarian situation and remember in the beginning of the 90s, Viktor Orban and Istvan Hegedisch were quite good friends uh, in the same party. Just Viktor Orban, he was a guy from the countryside and uh, Istvan is from Budapest, from the urban center. So in this respect, now Istvan is part of the uh, latte macchiato drinkers, whereas Tan stands for tradition, authoritarian rule, the national kind of model. Those are the beer drinkers coming predominantly not from the capital cities and not from uh, the cities altogether. So, and you see that the main axis of party competition is quite contrary to that what we have in the old frozen party systems in Western Europe. And also the bulk of Walters is quite longer, so the edges are stronger, whereas in the old frozen party systems the center was stronger. That means you want to win elections, you have to move to the center. Whereas now you also can move to the edges in order to uh, win elections. So this is pretty much what is uh, going on behind the scenes. And uh, what is happening actually is not that the Eastern European party systems are turning into the direction of uh, the party systems in Western Europe, but the Western European party systems are turning into the directions and to the direction where the Eastern European party system already has been for quite a while. And this is to be explained by the fact that uh, the voting behavior in Eastern Europe was always was much more fluid because it was not based on the three classical cleavages. I think, and this now I come to, to my topic uh, of uh, the regional differences and the role of, of the regions and, and, and uh, uh, electoral behavior in uh, rural areas, the two cleavages which has a territorial basis, center periphery and uh, urban versus rural, I think are becoming dominant all over Europe 
including North America. So if you check the political landscape of North America, the political landscape of the US election, and you see that uh, Trump, of course, was much more, much more successful in uh, rural areas where uh, people uh, lost their jobs in industries who were in decline. So the Rust Belt, for example, this is a region where this tongue pole becomes stronger and stronger, whereas the voters of Clinton were predominantly sitting on the Gaza side. So, you see, countries are no latecomers, as I predicted in the beginning, but they are forerunners and they were at the forefront uh, of the changes we see now. But what is stunning is that if we check the map on the left side, we see that economically, Although there are several problems, economically uh, the countries of East and Central Europe are amongst those regions with the highest GDP growth in Europe. They kind of got integrated into this uh, kind of German machine of uh, automobile production and uh, unemployment is in many areas of East and Central Europe, in many areas, not everywhere, not a big issue anymore as long as you are mobile. So there is a lot of work in Budapest, there is a lot of work in Prague, in Bratislava, in, in Warsaw. You can move to the European Union if you are young, if you are mobile, if you are well educated, if you do speak foreign languages. And this is the basis of growth, of course. But if you are not willing to move, if you are not young, not educated, then you have very little opportunities. And uh, if you check upon uh, the regional differences in the countries in Eastern Central Europe, then you see that they are much bigger than in Western Europe. Just to give you one example. Uh, the richest region in East and Central Europe is Bratislava, ranked 6th in the European Union, with 184% of uh, EU average GDP. Second, uh, uh, on 7, Prague, 182%. Whereas the weakest region in the European Union is Sverosopaden in Bulgaria with 29% percent of EU average. But what is more interesting than the numbers as such is the spread. The spread between the richest regions and uh, the poorest region. And this is 47 in Bulgaria and 121 in the Czech Republic. And you find those big spreads everywhere in East and Central Europe and they are bigger than they are in the western uh, in, in, in the western part of the European Union. The second the second uh, thing what is puzzling is that uh, is, although there is a lot of growth and you think okay if the economy economy is running smoothly if there are jobs uh, the democratic situation should be stable. Now I look at the chart on the right side. This is uh, based on the newest Bertel, Bertelsmann study uh, on the region, East and Central Europe. Uh, the backdrop in democratic development, the, the quality of democracy in the last 10 years. It's stunning, isn't it? So uh, in almost all indicators they measured, there is a backdrop. So democracy is not evolving, but it's devolving. Uh, in my understanding, this is directly uh, attached to uh, what we call globalization. Of course, you, you could define it, and there are many globalizations. But if we take globalization as uh, the, the Koff Institute, which is the dominant institute in terms of research of, on globalization, uh, take, then we see an interesting 
uh, chart here. They distinguish between de facto globalization, so how is globalization de facto evolving, and how is politics following that? So how do they kind of uh, attach regulations to globalization? And we see that uh, in economic globalization, de facto globalization is much stronger than the euro, whereas in all other uh, issues, the euro globalization is higher than de facto. So there are actually more rules in place to regulate everything than uh, you actually need to do it, save in economy. So what we have here is a kind of unleashed new Manchester capitalism, which is in urgent need of regulations. And in this kind of unleashing uh, capitalism, everybody again profits who is young, who is mobile, who uh, speaks the languages, who is good educated, they profit a lot. Whereas those who are not well educated, not speaking languages, not being young and mobile, they suffer. So that adds exactly to the picture what we have when checking on, upon the electoral results at uh, using this Gal and uh, Tan uh, divide. So if we I just take one map, which is, of course, just uh, one country, the country I know best in terms of uh, East and Central Europe. And we see where, where are the basis of uh, the parties. Sorry, I left it in Hungarian. So uh, if you take anti-EU rhetorics as the basis, so anti-EU parties are actually those parties who have a strong anti-EU, anti-Brussels rhetorics. And you see that, uh, for example, Jobbik uh, has uh, the strongholds uh, in, those in those regions being the least developed, that is the northeast of Hungary, partly the south of Hungary. And so, unfortunately, Fidesz is dominant almost everywhere. So you really cannot uh, read out something from that. But uh, if you compare uh, uh, not the divide uh, based on economic performance, but you take uh, uh, center periphery, the old cleavage, then you see the difference taking, taking Budapest. It's down here. This is the map of Budapest, where you have uh, a strong socialist uh, so socialist basis, and remember that the socialists in uh, Hungary in the 90s were implementing the Washington Consensus. They, they were, in economic terms, they were a liberal party, and uh, so they dominant, dominate the center and uh, are almost visible in the other parts of uh, Hungary, save bigger cities, and again we have this territorial divide, like uh, Seged, uh, down right, and uh, Peach, down left. So those are electoral results in uh, Poland, and uh, we have uh, Polish colleagues here, so they can explain it uh, much better than I ever could. But you see a divide between uh, a Poland and a B Poland, A Poland being pretty much the west of the country, uh, the big cities like Orso, the old Indra, industrialized cities. And the more industry you have, the more workplaces you have, the more are uh, Polish voters voting for parties being oriented on uh, the GAL. Uh, pole of the party system, whereas the more they are living in rural areas, on the periphery, in smaller villages or rural areas, they are voting for uh, parties being located in the uh, town pole. So, uh, when putting 
the lecture results and uh, um, even more, uh, yeah, uh, closer uh, focus, closer lens, then you see that, okay, there is a, a quite uh, strong difference in terms of uh, where you live, but another result is interesting that the uh, tentpole is the more stronger, the more a region is declining. So it's a difference whether a region has a, a, a weak performance in terms of GDP or it is declining. So let's say you have a, a GDP of, of 100 in one region and a GDP of 90 in another uh, region, then uh, it may be that the uh, anti-EU voting in the region having 100 GDP is stronger than in the region uh, having 90. If the region having 90 is stable, but the region having 100 is coming from 110. So if there is decline, anti-EU voting and voting for the town poll is uh, stronger. So uh, to summarize, the problem we are facing is a territorial one, or it at least partly is a territorial one, and we have to take uh, some, some consequences from that, uh, especially in European regional policy. This is, we have to invest in those regions who are declining in terms of education, in terms of culture, in terms of uh, bringing work to where the people are, instead of bringing people to where the work is. Because if you take people from those areas, having living there for ages, to the urban centers, they never will feel at home. And this is one kind of frustration. You either stay, but there is no work, there is no perspective, or you have to move, but you you have to move somewhere where your, your social environment is not there anymore. And this kind of frustration leads to voting for parties situated in the tentpole. And uh, this tentpole is more than just the question of Europe. The only, uh, it transforms into anti-EU voting because it is actually voting against this uh, globalization, this opening up of, of the economies, and the European Union, of course, is the most visible institution uh, uh, representing these changes. So I, I presented that to some uh, uh, people from the European Union, and they said, well, yeah, hmm, yes, so we are still following the model, bring people to where the work is, but I disagree completely, you have to bring the work to where the people are. And this is the change we really should focus on in the near future. Thank you very much. I'd like to ask the panelists whether they have maybe short comments to each other's presentations, maybe questions, uh, and then we would open uh, the floor for a few questions. Hopefully we'll still have a little bit of time. So. Please try to be brief, and then we can still take a few questions. I have a question to the ma uh, Madame Enage. Uh, you talked about corruption, and uh, I have the, young, the newest numbers here on corruption in East and Central Europe, and uh, there are huge differences. For example, if you, being asked corruption for you, corruption is unacceptable or not. So 35% of the Hungarians said, that corruption is unacceptable. Only 35%, where in Romania at least it is 58%. Uh, how widespread is corruption in your country? Hungary, 86%. So it's widespread, but it is not a problem. Uh, I wonder whether this kind of uh, combination is as well part of, of, of the explanation of uh, 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 the success of uh, populist parties because being in power uh, they often establish a corrupt system and it's like a, a snowball system in order to keep it up 
they have to change the rules. So changing rules is needed to stay in power and is needed to keep up the corrupt system because actually that once in, you cannot leave anymore. So how, how do you explain those differences in, 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 in the Eastern Central Europe? So, yeah, that I, I, I'm not so sure that I can uh, answer in a satisfactory way, but uh, of course uh, for Romania historically cor corruption, so to say, was a part of survival. In uh, the communist time it was a part of survival also. So, the, so to say the small corruption, the everyday corruption was part of the system because uh, uh, so many products necessary for survival were unavailable, so people had to uh, conform to different uh, illegal, small illegal practices to be able to uh, to have food or, or uh, medicines or so, so on. So in a way, corruption was part of the historical uh, heritage. But on the other hand, now we speak of corruption combined with, uh, with politics. And uh, one of the slogans of the civil society in Romania was uh, that corruption kills when we had, uh, uh, when we had uh, to confront situations like a nightclub where people died in fire because all the uh, laws were, uh, uh, so the laws were not respected when building uh, uh, that uh, nightclub. There was no control because of the bribery system. So everything can be solved with some kind of briberies. On the other hand, under development in Romania of the infrastructure, of the health care, of the school system, of agriculture, environmental protection is also because uh, uh, our governments, but mostly this one I would say, uh, were uh, rejecting uh, the possibility to attract European funds. Why? Simply because European funds need to be supervised by European institutions and corruption is much more visible. So, because the, the, uh, the, the national uh, uh, capitalism uh, and the, the capital is not so strong, they would prefer not to, uh, not to develop infrastructure or hospitals or so on, uh, uh, because with a little bit of, uh, of <laughs> big corruption, then they can give some uh, partial satisfaction to the voters. So it is, it is a, an endemic problem in Romania, but it is the first time, I would say, in the last five years when corruption, high-level corruption and political corruption became the dominant theme of the, of the political discourse and of the protesters in uh, before it was much more, uh, the protests were much more related to the reforms uh, of the society, to the demantling of communism, to the lustration and so on. This, uh, uh, in the last years, corruption became the dominant theme of the civil society because corruption in Romania is condemning Romania to underdevelopment. And this is visible. So many people are uh, living, uh, uh, young people are leaving the country because they, they, ca they cannot, they do not want to accept this corrupt system. Uh, I have a question to Professor Diringer. Um, if I understand correctly your presentation, uh, you seem to have uh, sort of isolated the one variable, the territoriality essentially, um, the location, geographic location of voters as the single most important factor in distinguishing or dividing the population, the voters between anti-EU and pro-EU uh, on a general basis and, and thereby also distinguishing between those who lean towards those authoritarian, populist uh, 
values and, and those liber and the liberal ones. And I'm wondering whether, to what extent, you're actually using this as a proxy for socioeconomic status rather than just the place where people live. And the subsequent question is whether this hypothesis actually holds uh, in other countries, in other settings. For example, in, in, in the UK, we know that the referendum on Brexit, in the referendum, the uh, social economic status was not the most important factor in deciding whether the people voted uh, to leave or stay. It was education and, and age, age and education. I actually don't know which one was more important, but the two were definitely more important ones than uh, the location. Um, in Czech Republic, we had the presidential elections last year I mentioned, and the votes for the illiberal candidates were also driven much more by age and education than by the uh, territoriality. Um, with Trump, you mentioned uh, the, the, the Rust Belt as the sort of decisive uh, uh, place or origin of, uh, the, of, of the decisive uh, number of voters for, for Trump. Well, I believe that this has been refuted already by uh, empirical research. Uh, for example, Pippa Norris and Ronald Inglehart have recently published uh, uh, a major study on, on that, and they argue that uh, it was much more, um, again, education and cultural values driving the votes for Trump or uh, on, the other hand, uh, on the other hand to, 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 to Hillary. So again, social economic status perhaps not as important as it, it, as, it, as it might seem. So my question essentially is whether you think that uh, this is a hypothesis that has been tested enough in other uh, circumstances and, and, and uh, regional contexts that uh, might hold. Shall I answer directly? Or yeah, and um, please try to, to do so short, briefly brief, so we can yeah. still collect a few questions. Yes. Yeah, so in Inglehart predicted in 71 already the joining of forces of worker, the working class, and conser conservative values. So in this respect, it is not surprising to me that people uh, subscribing to uh, conservative values, of course, are supporters of populist parties, as those are the only ones standing uh, outside this mainstream of uh, liberal values, which was dominant during the uh, last couple of decades. But I wouldn't really uh, separate socio-economic status and age and education, because that belongs together. Yes, it is a socio-economic status, and the fact that but the fact is that in rural areas, people are older and they are less educated. This is why you have this uh, geographical dimension within the voter behavior. But of course, the cappuccino drinkers in a, in a, in a, in a, in a small village uh, will not uh, vote for populist parties. The problem is that there are no cappuccino drinkers. So my name is I'm former chairman of the European Council on the Future of Europe and, and chairman of the Civico Movement. I have one question for uh, all of you. What kind of political, if you have one political recommendation for the EU, saying what you have said, which one? My name is Esther Noz. I would like to have two short questions. One is to Mr. Deringer. Uh, if I really like this Gartan model, but it's absolutely true in Hungary as well, and if it's true, which proves the case, then we are really doomed because there are 8 million people in the countryside and only less than 2 million people in Budapest, so there is no hope. Uh, <laughs> this was a, maybe a whatever question. And the other one is to, Ms. to Wojtek. Uh, do you think the illiberal uh, fade-out process has started by the suspension of Fidesz uh, from the EPP? Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Andrzej Kork. I'm from Slovakia. I have a question for almost all in uh, Istvan, uh, starting with Istvan. Uh, you said this, this is the biggest challenge. Your question is about the radical parties, whether they will get one third of mandates or votes. Uh, why, why is, is it that why one third? And why do you think what is it based on? You know this assessment or estimate. The second is uh, question is to Václav. Um There was this issue about. Um, 
this ties into mainstream media and use of social media, which is, you say, this correlation that you mentioned about uh, uh, these uh, different roles of legacy media in Western Europe and Eastern Europe. And I just wonder how it is, uh, whether it's uh, mainly fits together because it seems to be somehow not so much correlated. And I have different hypotheses what is there behind this task of traditional media and higher trust and higher use of social media in Central Eastern Europe, actually. And then, don't mind, uh, a question to uh, uh, in Inash. And okay. In okay. Uh, how come it, there, I was told that there are no extreme right wing parties, significant right extreme right wing parties in Romania? How is that? And the second question would be, you mentioned that the current government is anti-European, but uh, pro-European, but it's also nationalistic somehow, so it seems to be like contradiction. How come it is uh, described or discussed in public discourse, this kind of contradiction? Uh, my question is to Václav, what uh, actually Zhuzha already, Zhuzha already asked you about. Do populists have an advantage today when using uh, whatever political communication methods? Or did non-populists also caught up and using the political communication techniques the same way? So it's, it's not the case anymore. Is it more a myth? Or is it true that Trump and others can use Twitter better? Or there is an e even competition? In my very short answer to Andre's uh, uh, question. Uh, I think that populists will not receive uh, one third of the mandates, votes and mandates in the European elections, but we have already seen uh, before in 2016 that we might be very wrong, and so we have to be careful. I think that that's uh, what I mean is altogether the one third, uh, or altogether less than one third, and it's another question whether populists will. Uh, gang up in one political group or they will have many groups in the European Parliament because there might be a risk that uh, the main cleavage will be between pro-Europeans pro -European, pro and anti-Europeans whatever groups they join. If this is the number one political issue in the future we, what we will face then uh, it will be a very hard period for uh, non-populist or pro-Europeans when that's the only agenda and that would be also at uh, risk even if they do not get uh, one-third of the votes. Yes, I, I would recommend to the, uh, to the future uh, political European Union to invest more in citizens and invest more at the grassroots level. In the 90s we were speaking about uh, investing much more in, in a European identity. It didn't happen. Uh, the programs uh, evoluted very much to very bureaucratic visions, themes elaborated in the, the offices and forced on the uh, NGOs in the countries. Extreme right parties. Uh, extreme right parties exist in, in Romania, but they are not among the five or six parties in the government, so we do not have them. The coalition parties in government, the Social Democrats, Liberals, and the Hungarian Union, they a little bit follow the Visegrad model of illiberal democracy, restraining uh, fundamental uh, uh, rights. The opposition parties, the Lib Liberal Party, the Salvation of Romania Party, uh, are, are mostly pro-European parties, but they also tolerate among them members and even candidates for the European elections, which are populist or nationalistic. So the, the small prince, the petit prince, would say, rien n'est parfait but some are more perfect than others, however. So we will support the pro-Europeans. But the civil society in Romania, in Romania cannot stop its uh, struggle for a better democracy uh, just supporting these parties. We will try to correct them a little bit, to pressure on them. Thank you. 
Thank you very much. That's, that's the point. All right, I believe I got it. Three questions, including the one which was the collective uh, question uh, about the political recommendations for the EU. I assume that uh, what you are asking is what can the EU do in order to improve the appeal for the European project? Is and keep maintaining unity. And keep maintaining unity. Um, well, uh, as a political communication scholar, I tend to approach these questions issues from a communication perspective. So for me, the problem of European Union, problem of European project, is in a way uh, the problem of uh, uh, communication. So the European Union being unable uh, to successfully communicate uh, the advantages of, of uh, uh, the European project to the voters. And here we are uh, hitting the wall in, in the uh, uh, in form of the disengagement of, of voters, especially the younger ones. And I think that the one challenge which the European Union should, should try to tackle is how to uh, bring the young voters to, to, to elections. It's a general problem, uh, not just on the European level, of course, but the European Union might have some opportunities and possibilities how to uh, be more efficient in, in uh, uh, tackling this, this kind of communication deficit as, as, uh, uh, alongside with the democratic deficit. And one, one way of doing it is obviously to try to reach the young potential voters where they can be found, and that's not in the mainstream media anymore. It's on the social, social networking sites. And uh, I, I just give an example from the Czech Republic where uh, the most, one of the sing most popular YouTubers uh, YouTubers, for those of you who don't, who don't know, are the celebrities of the younger generation. And, and they are listening to them, they are getting their news or information about the world from them. And one of the most popular news YouTubers has been recently sort of contracted, or uh, he's volunteered to promote, to, 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 to create education series of educational videos to promote uh, awareness of uh, uh, actually of disinformation and fake news and problems like that, and also to try to engage and, and uh, motivate uh, uh, young uh, people uh, to to come to elections and, and to engage politically. So that one be, that, that that's uh, my my recommendation. Uh, then uh, Istvan asked about uh, and actually uh, Susa as well. Do populists have an advantage uh, nowadays? Uh, given the kind of uh, a rapidly and dramatically changing communication environment, and I, my answer is yes, they do. This is the environment that suits them much more, much better than us or <laughs> anyone else who doesn't count to, to, to themselves to, to that uh, side and who wants to preserve liberal democratic values. Unfortunately, we have to uh, consider this uh, issue from a historical perspective. Liberal democracy has evolved historically hand in hand with the evolution of professional journalism, mass traditional mass media. It cannot be separated. Uh, and, and, and we are now in a very painful period of time when professional journalism loses its uh, appeal, loses its uh, audience, loses its status. Information is generated, produced and distributed in a completely different manner than it used to be 20, 25 years ago. It cannot go without consequences for political sphere. So, there is obviously issues of economy and, and things uh, of territorial uh, factors of territoriality, but the question of why exactly these uh, uh, populist agendas are so popular exactly in this period of time is, for, my, for me, explained very much by uh, pointing out to the, to, the, to the ways communication is organized and disseminated. So, yes, we are um, pulling a short straw here in this battle with, with, with the populists who are thriving in the social media environment and it will take time uh, before the liberal side kind of catches up. It will also take, uh, I'm afraid, uh, some actual regulatory uh, attempts to regulate the environment better, uh, the communication environment, the platforms, to make them uh, assume and accept more responsibility for uh, the kind of content that is uh, circulating on their networks, through their networks, especially when it comes to hate speech, when, when it comes to disinformation. And finally, there was a question uh, by Andre uh, concerning the kind of correlation between distrust to mainstream media and the uh, higher use of social media. Uh, which 
can be observed from the data we have. And I must say that I present this data without having a, a kind of full-fledged hypothesis about the nature of this correlation. I'm, I'm just presenting it as a state of fact. This is what we're dealing with. I don't know exactly which way this correlation goes. You know, what is the independent and dependent variable here? Um, it might be that the two are actually supporting each other. Uh, it might be the case that there is some other factor behind, but this is the situation we are in, that uh, simply we cannot rely in our fights or battle or struggle against populism in Central and Eastern Europe, we cannot rely as much on legacy traditional established media as in the West. Uh, well, in the West, we have uh, observed in many countries, US, UK, France, the so-called Trump bump, uh, the, the, the kind of sudden uh, rise of subscriptions to quality elite, elite quality professional media like the New York Times, Washington Post, The Guardian, Financial Times, they all have benefited from Trump and from Brexit, from the surge of populists, because people have suddenly realized <coughs> that these media are struggling, and these are professional journalists uh, who are producing quality information that is essential for the battle against populists. So, uh, curiously, they have profited. It, this is yet to be seen in Central and Eastern Europe. I have one example from Czech Republic, actually. Uh, there's a new daily, a liberal daily, which was just established uh, uh, at, the, at the end of last year, and it has uh, uh, mir miraculously gathered more than um, 10,000 subscribers within a short period of time. It enabled this originally online daily to start producing its print version, so now it's a successful player on the, on the, on the market. We'll see if, if something like that can be uh, uh, replicated uh, uh, elsewhere. Okay, I'll stop here. Mm -hmm. okay. um, on the on the recommendation, um, I would be just perhaps only supportive, uh, which is which is a good thing um, here. Uh, towards Václav's uh, <coughs> idea, Europe has done nothing, really, uh, to answer to its existential problem institutional building, democratic institutional building, in education. Uh, we have been living on, the, Europe has been living and continuing to live on, on the ticket of the memory of the Second World War for maybe three generations. But now with the new generations, uh, this message and the message of democratic institution building is not as... Um, vibrant in the, in the younger generation as it used to be. So, the, so be it, uh, what is the name of oh. Yeah, the guy... Kobe. Uh, yeah. Kobe. Kobe. Uh, so be it Kobe or on YouTube channel He's or... He's already old. <laughs> yeah. He's already at 25. <laughs> uh, but be it, be it YouTube channels or, uh, or whatever other uh, activism media, Europe also needs a structured uh, effort to educate people into democracy. Democracy will not hold without being educated into people. I, I, I know this is absolutely, this is pol, pol, Polish, or this is non-British English, but this is, this is to stress how uh, important it is to build up democracy, because with that, without that effort, uh, Europe will not hold as a democratic or a project of democratic nation states or uh, an effort to make it a democratic space overall um, in total. And that is a challenge because of course this is, but it is a political priority because it is not in the competences of the EU currently. It, doesn't, it does not have the competence to build in educational projects, uh, pro programs uh, across the EU at the same time, without which we will not have um, a democratic Europe uh, in the future. To illustrate and to close uh, on this point, um, in the recent elections in Poland, if, if one wants to distinguish between pro-European voting and anti-European voting, or kind of Eurosceptic, even though in Poland population overall throughout every poll demonstrates more than 80% of support for the EU, the only social group 
was the age that voted uh, for a civic platform with a clear pro-European message, no skepticism attached, no question mark put into the shape of EU, was the group that had uh, at least partly been, been exposed to the EU integration lessons in the schools that ended in 2004. In Poland, not in every V4 country, I think, in uh, the Central European country, we have had a program that was supported with, uh, by the uh, European Union to have classes on European integration. And that, and that age group that was then teenagers is, or was in the recent elections, the only age group that voted for a pro-European uh, message in the elections. That is largely generalization. You can you can smash my argument to pieces just in a moment. <laughs> uh, but overall, this this is this is just to uh, nail your to, to have your attention on, on the point of uh, uh, democratic building uh, education in in Europe as a European Union uh, priority. On the illiberal fade out and the suspension of Fidesz, uh, I do believe so. I support it. I support it more than expelling it right away. I support expelling it at some point. But uh, I believe that in, in, uh, uh, in the case of illiberals or non-democratic or less than democratic uh, uh, actors, you need to have an instrument of conditionality. If you, if you just, you know, we've been playing it usually with European Union neighbors, we have had conditionality with Central European uh, political actors until there was a, a accession into EU. But the moment there was accession into EU, you cannot put conditionality on them. Within the European People's Party, which is the big carrot for Viktor Orban, you can, you can have conditionality me mechanism, but you have to be consistent with it and, yeah, you. you you have to chew it. I mean, you have, you have to have Viktor Orban still, still on board for, for a time being, right? I mean, to have influence on his agenda. The most successful program of the European Union is Erasmus. It produced more than a million babies, and most of them will become tongue voters, I guarantee. A gal to sorry. No, I think you're absolutely right that education is absolutely central and there could be done more. The, the central problem is that the European Union has uh, very little competences in the educational field and it relates pretty much on uh, the national governments to participate in those programs or to uh, attach sources to such programs and if you have anti European governments, of course, there is no wish to attach European sources to programs like that. But maybe we could work well with conditionality in that case. Well, there are sources, but with that goes some education on the European Union. Uh, is there hope? Well, um, I think that uh, town governments tend to uh, invest more in uh, what the Hungarians would call BDX, so the countryside. In uh, investing in the countryside, of course, they create cappuccino and uh, cappuccino drinkers or not beer drinkers, and in the end, they will cannibalize themselves. So, uh, it's it's actually a side effect of investing in uh, the countryside that you create poles of growth where people usually. Uh, subscribe to more modern values than traditional values, and that will divert those people from the country, uh, from from the government, who actually invested in that region. But that, that is a very long time span. So I think the best, the, the biggest hope for you is that the uh, fetus will be just, you know, collapsing like, like, like many many governments collapse after a certain time in power which is a natural phenomenon, but maybe some people have time to wait, others don't have time to wait. So, one recommendation, uh, bring a look to where the people are, or face the revenge of the places that don't matter anymore. <laughs>